So I want to think a little bit more generally today about what is it that would change kinetic energy. So I'm just going to take the time derivative of this expression that we have. I'm going to work only in one dimension for the moment. So I'm going to take the time derivative of 1 half mv squared. So I'm thinking of a particle, and it has some kinetic energy. What would be its change with time? And I hope you agree now that that's a socially responsible derivative with respect to time. But m dv dt is a whole lot like m a, right? So m a, I can just regroup, and I get that this term times that, that's m a multiplied by v. But if we believe that the sum of the forces produces the acceleration times the mass, then I can replace m a with f standing here for the sum of all the external forces or the forces on this mass. So now I have that the time rate of change of the kinetic energy is equal to the product of the force and the velocity. So I just multiply both sides by a little infinitesimal time interval. And then how can I simplify the left? Can I? Yeah, it's just dk. Right? The little bit of change in that little in interval of time, dt, would be dk. And what about the right? That's trickier. What would I get on the right? dx, right? Because v is dx dt. So dx dt times dt should be dx. And so the change in kinetic energy is caused by moving a force through a displacement. So if I think about this situation, gravity going down, the force of gravity is in the same direction as uh, the speed that would be developed. And sure enough, we expect that the kinetic energy of this object as it's falling will increase. That seems to make sense. On the other hand, on the other hand, how many other hands do you have? All right, so six. OK, if I consider a, the same particle, and now it's orbiting, so that the velocity and the force are not parallel to one another, then what do we expect to happen for this particle as it goes around? It's just going to go around at constant speed. So no change in the kinetic energy for a circular orbit. So it can't just be I only worry about the force and the velocity. The direction is crucial. If the direction is perpendicular, then no change. If the direction is parallel, then I get a change. So I think we have to bite the bullet and move into 3D. Got your glasses? Yeah, yeah, I'll bet you do, Ian. <laughs> OK, so let's do the same thing. I have to now write out the kinetic energy as the sum of the components squared of the velocity in uh, three orthogonal directions, x, y, and z. But the, the chain rule and the power law work just the same. So I hope you'll agree that on the right-hand side, we have uh, a socially responsible derivative of the kinetic energy, term by term. On the left is just the time change in the kinetic energy. And on the right, if I rearrange and just put the order of the terms slightly differently, I have m a sub x times v sub x, m a y, v sub y, and so on. 
and using the same trick, that is the force components in the Cartesian directions multiplied by the corresponding velocity components. How would you rewrite this thing based on your extensive knowledge of linear algebra? Is that the dot product of F and V? F dot V? So this is saying DK DT is F dot V. Does that look right? Let's hope. So multiplying through by DT, what's changing kinetic energy is the force dotted into a little bit of displacement. What do you know about dot products? <laughs> right, so I'm hearing that if the two vectors are orthogonal, so if I had two vectors A and B, and this is a right angle, then the dot product is zero. But in general, is there a geometric understanding of the dot product? Mumble, 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 mumble. Yes, OK, so let, let's go look at that. So I'm going to line up my vector A along the x-axis, just for grins. And B will be at some angle with respect to, let's see, I called it AB. And A dot B, allegedly, is the product of the magnitudes of A and B times the cosine of the angle between. We saw before that we only care about the component that's parallel. So let me extract the component of B that's parallel. That would be this component. And that would be the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle theta AB. So A times B parallel, and in, if I were to take a general vector A expressed in its components, A sub X, X unit vector plus A sub Y, and so on, and take the dot product, if I use the fact that perpendicular vectors have a dot product of zero, the nine terms that I should get in the dot product of A dot B, right? There should be nine because I should get the first, first, second, first, third, second, first, and so on. There should be nine complete terms, but most of them are zero because the unit vectors in the three Cartesian directions are orthogonal to one another, and so all the ones that don't involve the same vector disappear. So we get by this method that the dot product is just what you thought. So it's consistent with this argument that the dot product is the magnitude of one vector, the magnitude of the other vector, the cosine of the angle between, or it's the whole magnitude of a vector and then the component of the other vector that's parallel. Now, I want you to keep track of all three different ways of thinking about the dot product because in some problems, it's way easier to use one method than the other. Don't just always go back to writing out the components. It may just save you a lot of work to think about what's the component of the second vector that's parallel to the first, okay?